Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I am my Professor Ioana Julaki, and I'm delighted to be here today to talk about uh, my career and my research achievements. So thanks very much for all of you for coming here today. I know some of you have um, traveled to be here today. Some of you have uh, changed your travel plans. Uh, and some of you are online, so thank you very much. And I thought I'll start um, telling you a little bit about my career and how I uh, ended up here. And I think when we talk about careers, um, we all have um, a same picture in our heads, maybe a ladder that we climb. But I was thinking that mine looks a little bit like that, and maybe most of the people look a little bit like that, where there are many falls throughout the way. So the association is not linear. And it's a mistake we often do in epidemiology as well, um, assuming that everything is linear. And there are a lot of uh, falls, a lot of failures, which uh, are a good thing. For me, they have given me clarity. They have uh, given me clarity to understand where I wanted to go back to. Um, sometimes you get a boost to go back uh, stronger and continue and progress. So this is me in reception. And I really, if I remember myself as a student, I really liked physics, science, maths. Um, I found those subjects you know, great, and um, this is what I wanted to do. At the same time, I really remember once uh, during high school that I broke a mirror. And a good friend of mine told me, oh my god, now this means seven years of bad luck. I was really upset because I was 13 then, and I thought, oh my god, I have to wait until I'm 20 years old. But then I started thinking, I mean, how does this work? I mean, what's this, the evidence for that? And I really wanted to study um, how things work and have explanations for things. So I wanted to study maths, but um, a lot of my professors back then in uh, Greece, they told me I'm a good student, and good students were doing medicine at that time. So I was convinced that uh, medicine is my thing, and I gave exams for medicine twice, and I failed twice. So I studied biomedical science instead, with the expectation that I would later go to study science, uh, medicine, sorry. I went to university uh, in Athens. Um, it was heavy on the lab side, on the technical side of things, and I really enjoyed it. I became a very good student there, and, and I had the opportunity to do my um, practical training in the university maternity hospitals, hospital where we were doing karyotypes. So we were doing pre-pregnancy pre tests and then pregnancy tests and have karyotypes. And I really liked it. I thought, you know, that's really exciting genetics. So I decided I'm not going back to pursuing medicine and I'll continue doing genetics. I looked up some courses, some master courses, postgraduate courses. I applied to Imperial for a genetic um, master course, but they rejected me. So uh, my second choice was Edinburgh, where I followed a course called Quantitative Genetics and Genome Analysis. Now, I have to be honest, I didn't quite focus on the term quantitative at the beginning. And it was only when I went there that I realized that the course was more maths and genetics. I mean, what else can one ask for? It was great for me. And I really enjoyed it. This is Peter Visser here, who um, was one of the main lecturers of the course, and with whom um, we did um, the first studies, linkage studies, uh, genetic linkage studies on schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, something that I enjoyed very much. I finished my MSc with a distinction, and I thought I want to remain in this field. So I wanted to pursue a PhD. Again, I applied to Imperial with uh, David Balding and John Whitaker that were here at that time in our department that I'm now. Um, they offered me a studency, but then Imperial rejected it because I didn't have very good first degree. So again, that was a good thing because um, I ended up um, again in Edinburgh where I was offered a studency uh, to study um, epidemiology and genetic epidemiology of peripheral arterial disease. I did my PhD on the Edinburgh artery study with uh, Jerry Fox. Jerry was a great supervisor. I'm not uh, telling that because he's uh, here with me today. 
uh, but he has been really great giving me opportunities, introducing me to many people, um, giving me the ability to design my, the studies that I wanted to, uh, to pursue the research that I wanted to, and in general to have a very healthy attitude towards work and research and everything, which was very motivating for me. So um, Jerry had designed this uh, study, it's called the Andy Browatory study, 1,592 participants, I remember. It is quite small compared to the epidemiological studies I'm working with today, but even from that time it had um, very deep phenotyping, so a lot of biomarkers measured. Here is a panel of um, thrombotic and inflammatory biomarkers that were measured in the study. Um, and measures of uh, subclinical atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis that um, doesn't uh, have clinical signs at the time, uh, but exists uh, in otherwise healthy individuals. And the focus was peripheral uh, atherosclerosis, so not, the one, not in the arteries that supply blood to the heart, but in the arteries of the legs, for example, the carotid arteries, etc. I investigated the association between those inflammatory biomarkers with atherosclerosis, because at that time we began to realize that atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease was not simply a lipid disorder, but inflammation, chronic inflammation, was probably playing um, a significant role in uh, disease uh, progression. There, we did a lot of work and the, the PhD was quite successful in having very good publications out of it, um, which compared inflammatory and thrombotic factors, investigated the association with uh, cardiovascular disease. And I finished within three years having um, very good outcomes and, and being very pleased uh, with the work. However, at that point, I've also met my um, husband, Panos, uh, who was living back in Greece back then. So as soon as I finished my PhD, I went back home and um, I wanted to stay there. However, one day um, we had a sort of a, a fight and I thought, you know what, I'm going back to the UK. So I applied to a job for a lectureship at Imperial College London. I think subconsciously I knew that I'm not going to get this job. I had just finished my PhD and it was very unlikely that I would be offered the post. However, I had the interview. Here is Paul Elliott, who was a chair of the interview panel uh, back then. Uh, having had the interview that evening, to my surprise, Paul called me and uh, he said, this is a very risky appointment, but we want to offer you the job. Um, so Panos moved with me and we came to London to start. And I started my job here at Imperial as a non-clinical uh, lecturer in epidemiology. Now coming from a PhD, which was focused on peripheral atherosclerosis, uh, to the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics, I remember I met Paul in his big round office um, uh, table, in his office, and he explained to me the different work streams that um, were happening at the department. He told me that I need to find one and I should focus on that. I did completely the opposite because I found all those work streams quite interesting. So I started working with uh, Marjorita Harveling on birth cohorts and uh, we studied the early life effects and the life course epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. I also worked on the small area health statistics unit um, using um, uh, maps and mapping the inequalities uh, that were associated with uh, cardiovascular disease. I also worked with electronic health record and CPRD, investigating um, uh, different uh, drugs for diabetes and their cardiovascular disease risk. And I also worked a lot on nutritional epidemiology, investigating the role of diet on blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. And here is Jerry Stamler, who was involved in the Intermap study, with whom um, we did a number of studies on diet and blood pressure. And I was very happy and I'm very grateful that I had the opportunity to work with Jerry and having him um, a bit of a mentor at that um, early stage of my career. And that work was going well. We had a number of BMJ covers covering uh, this uh, initial work. 
And I think for me, coming from a very narrow focus PhD, um, it was great that I was you know, exposed to this wide range of research streams, which had a focus on cardiovascular disease, but apart from that, were very uh, broad across the spectra of epidemiological methodologies. Now, having had that exposure, it made me, to, to the different work stream, it made me think a lot on what exactly are we trying to do with those associations. So, for example, a, a lot of the research was on C-reactive protein, that is an inflammatory protein, and its association with uh, cardiovascular disease. And if, we, if you look at the literature back then, you would find a lot of um, phrases that were trying to explain this association. Um, but what was it really? Did, were we trying to find just an association? Were we trying to find uh, whether CRP can predict the outcome? Um, whether CRP can uh, be an etiological factor for cardiovascular disease, a new treatment? And I thought I want to look deeper into what exactly um, we are trying to do. And I, I understood well at that point that you, know, you could get the result you wanted from the data if you didn't have a clear uh, plan of uh, what you wanted to show uh, in an association. A, a one thing you can look at is prediction. So whether, for example, C-reactive protein can predict cardiovascular disease. And I did um, a number of um, research projects, particularly on that theme on prediction. For, um, if we look at CRP again, <coughs> excuse me, and cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease um, is a disease where we, we are aware of a number of clinical risk factors that we can use them to um, predict whether someone is likely to develop cardiovascular disease. And based on that prediction, we offer uh, preventive treatment with statins. So we have the age and the gender of an individual, um, their blood pressure measurements, their cholesterol measurements, whether they smoke or not, their blood sugar levels, and the treatments they are receiving for blood pressure and um, diabetes. And um, Based on the information from those risk factors, we can um, estimate the probability of uh, having heart disease in the next 10 years. Now, if we have a good model and a good biomarker, that means that if we draw the distribution of that biomarker in cases and in controls, if this is discriminating well between cases and controls, those two um, peaks um, and distribution, they won't overlap. If they overlap, whichever threshold we are taking, we will have a lot of people um, misclassified, sort of classified as high risk where they don't get the event or classified as low risk and they are getting the event. So was CRP something, um, a, a biomarker that could be used for risk prediction? We did this nice paper here uh, in JAMA in 2009, where we actually calculated the discrimination of the model based on those risk factors, uh, and then difference of the discrimination when CRP was added on top of those factors. So we looked at the literature, we found all the studies that were published in this uh, space, and what we showed is that CRP was showing added discrimination, added value, when the clinical risk model was not working well. In other words, when we had a Stroman comparator, CRP was showing added discrimination, but that was not the case when we had a good clinical model. So that stimulated another body, a big body of work on risk prediction models, on how actually we should um, develop risk prediction models, on the importance of their validation, on the importance of impact studies. Um, and I worked a lot with uh, Carl Moons, with whom we have done uh, several uh, systematic reviews on risk prediction model. And, and that work led also to the a tool to assess the risk of bias uh, in these studies, as well as reporting guidelines for prediction model studies. Now, at the same time also, um, a few years after I joined Imperial, uh, Paul Elliott has asked me to join 
um, a working group on UK Biobank Enhancement Subgroup Committee. So UK Biobank is a, a landmark epidemiological study. It has recruited half a million participants aged 50 to 69 with the aim to look at the genetic and environmental causes of diseases. So it has like a, a broad aim uh, focusing also on uh, genetics, environment and their interaction. And this is the, the lab, the, the lab where samples from half a million people are stored uh, for people to subsequently do research on them. So they are kept in uh, freezers so that later on uh, we can use and measure new biomarkers that come up. I joined the UK Enhancement Working Group um, halfway during the recruitment. So at that time, 200,000 people were recruited in the study. And at the beginning, uh, because we weren't, sh it was a huge achievement. At the beginning, the baseline phenotyping of the participants uh, was kept to a minimal. The um, work of the UK Enhancement Subgroup Committee was to identify new measurements, clever measurements, novel measurements that could capture the environment, that could capture the phenotype of uh, those individuals. That was a huge learning experience for me. I sort of talked to all uh, the professors across the UK to suggest ideas, to suggest how we can improve the study. Uh, and it was very successful. I think a lot of the value of UK Biobank today um, comes from those additional measurements, such as the imaging study. So uh, the imaging study started from the UK Biobank Enhancement Committee, um, the DEXA scan that we have, physical activity monitoring with the accelerometer, uh, measurements and images of the eyes, uh, and many more, including the, the upfront biochemistry, the fact that um, the samples were analyzed to produce a panel of biomarkers, uh, as well as having the genome-wide association data available from the beginning. So having been involved in uh, the uh, UK Biobank Working Group, um, I also uh, became interested later on to use the study, along with many other researchers globally. Um, and one of the things that um, uh, the UK Biobank gave us the opportunity to do is um, study genetic determinants of diseases and of traits um, with um, much bigger power this time. So this is a study I did with Paul Elliott on 2009, um, a year after I joined Imperial. Um, this is a genome-wide association study, as we call it, where we identified one, two, three, four, five genes that were associated with C-reactive protein levels. So those were the genes that sort of um, associated with uh, the levels of the protein. And the study was on 21,000 people. My PhD student, Saredo uh, said, has done a great study published last, uh, this year actually, Nature Communication, where we had um, half a million people, including the UK Biobank this time. And you see that with this, additional sample size with this huge jump in the sample size, we were able to identify 266 genetic loci and really understand the genetic architecture of the trait in much um, greater detail this time. Here are, we can no longer fit this into a straight line and we do these circular plots where these are all the uh, genetic loci that have been robustly associated with uh, C-reactive protein levels. What can we do with uh, these uh, genetic loci? Well, one thing we can do is calculate a genetic risk score, as we call it, or a polygenic risk score nowadays, a PRS, which means that we take these um, uh, discoveries uh, and we calculate the cumulative effect of genetic variants in relation to a trait or disease. So if we assume that we have n polymorphism, each one of us will have zero, one, or two copies of that polymorphism, and we can get a score that ranges from zero to two n for each person. The polygenic risk scores can be used to predict whether someone is going to develop a, a disease. 
This is from a study we did in one million people this time for blood pressure. We identified 535 new loci, new genetic loci associated with uh, blood pressure. And we calculated the polygenic risk score, having the information from all those genetic loci. And you see here, as expected, that the polygenic risk score predicts your systolic blood pressure levels and whether uh, you will develop or not hypertension, which is what you would expect because this is the polygenic risk score for blood pressure. But it also predicts well the incident cardiovascular disease, myocardial infraction and stroke. So those polygenic risk scores, uh, based on the results from GWA studies, can be used for uh, disease prediction. However, the question remains whether this information, this genetic information, is, um, pr provides additional value to what we already can predict from clinical risk factors. And this question motivated this paper, led by Joshua Elliott, um, where we wanted to see whether a polygenic risk score for coronary heart disease can improve the predictive ability of a clinical risk score based on simple parameters that I talked uh, before, like age, sex, um, diabetes, blood pressure, smoking, and cholesterol levels. Remember those um, distributions again? You see that if we calculate the PRS, the polygenic risk score of heart disease, those distributions really overlap. So whichever threshold you are going to use based on your genetic risk score alone, you are going to get a lot of misclassifications. The clinical risk score does a little bit better. Again, we have risk classification. And what happens when you actually add the information of the two? This is the, this blue line that you see, it improves um, the green line here. Uh, but that in improvement is minimal. So the gain we are going to get from adding the um, genetic information to a clinical risk model is small and is not likely to change uh, the, the practice for the vast uh, majority of people, whether or not they are going to get a statin and uh, prevent cardiovascular disease. Now, genetic risk is often uh, thought as non-modifiable. So it is an information that you get, but you cannot change it, you cannot do much about it. What we wanted to do here to show is what, what you can do if you are high risk, high genetic risk. So we know, for example, that a lifestyle uh, parameters like smoking, alcohol consumption, diet, physical activity, and a healthy weight, uh, they all contribute to a lower cardiovascular risk. So we divided a population, a UK biobank population again, into six categories based on favorable, intermediate, and unfavorable lifestyle, low, intermediate, and high genetic risk. And what we showed in, another, in this paper um, led by Raha Pazoki is that across the genetic risk score categories, even when you were high genetic risk for high blood pressure, if you had a healthy lifestyle, you could decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease and bring it down to those people that have low genetic risk. So the fact that we often think of the genetic risk score as something deterministic, um, may not be the case, and actually, even at the high genetic risk, we can decrease uh, the, the risk for diseases based on, for example, a healthy lifestyle in this case. So nowadays, there is a lot of um, interest in uh, genetic risk scores uh, and polygenic risk scores, and those seem to get into practice. We have uh, Genome UK, and that this information is going to reach clinical practice. I think what's important to remember here is that still this remains one of the many risk factors we know for chronic diseases. And most importantly, that polygenic scores only measure a small proportion of the overall disease risk. So you could be given the information that you are, uh, have an 80% risk of ovarian cancer based on your polygenic risk score, but the baseline population risk is only 16%. So the, you are not 
And the, the fact that the genetic risk increases your risk, uh, it doesn't mean that you have an, a big increase. And that's often not communicated in a way that you know, the public understands uh, the measure and the effect size of this difference. And of course, we should continue our efforts to address modifiable risk factors and health inequalities. A lot of the variation in diseases uh, can be explained by socioeconomic differences, for example, and not by our differences in uh, genetic risk. So I talked a lot about prediction. What about etiology? Uh, the association between C-reactive protein and cardiovascular disease um, uh, my interest in this association doesn't need to be only prediction, but many times we want to show whether there is an etiological link between these two. That's important because then we can target C-reactive protein and change the outcome. Well, it's very difficult in epidemiology to show etiological relationship. We have confounding and reverse causation, and it's often very difficult to address those two. Um, here are cri criteria. Uh, that were proposed by Bradford and Hill that could help us um, determine we, whether an association is causal or not. However, many of these, I think, can be revisited today. Um, for example, the biological gradient, coherence, plausibility, I think we really don't know how to model those. Things like specificity, we know they don't work because we know risk factors that are causal and they are not specific to one disease. Smoking is uh, the example. Um, and I think we are left with experiment, which is coming under the clinical trials, but we cannot always do a clinical trial. And with consistency, we have replication. We can sort of have robust methods and, and replication to show that we find uh, the same association again and again. Uh, and that is probably uh, the best thing we can do. So coming from that uh, thinking, um, I was thinking that in genetic epidemiology, we have an agnostic hypothesis-free approach to associations. And uh, we take account of the fact that we do a lot of associations, we test a lot of associations, and we always replicate our results. And we call those genome-wide association study. So I thought, why don't we do the same in you know, sort of environmental epidemiology here in nutrition? So we did a study uh, called the Nutrient-Wide Association Study on Blood Pressure, where this time we didn't start with a hypothesis on whether one nutrient is associated with blood pressure, but we sort of examined the whole spectrum of nutrients that we had with blood pressure. We adjusted for the fact that we were agnostic, and we replicated our discoveries to an independent population. And uh, we came up with a list of uh, vitamins that were important to blood pressure. But it was important as a methodological paradigm um, to uh, bring the methodologies from genetic epidemiology to um, other uh, traditional epidemiology uh, settings. And I have done a lot of uh, those studies subsequently using the EPIC data, UK Biobank data, and other studies. At the same time, I was interested to um, study um, a field synopsis of how come single risk factors are associated with sort of diverse outcomes and bring together this body of evidence, for example, on vitamin D and the whole spectrum of health outcomes associated with it, uh, birth weight, uh, dietary fiber, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a body of work around um, this as well. But nowadays, we can go a step further towards causality. Um, we can leverage the information that we have from the GWAS studies. The GWAS studies study um, give you information on the genetic determinants of a single trait. So for example, if I take again the example of C-reactive protein levels, we now know the genetic variants that uh, contribute to the variability of C-reactive protein levels. And uh, we have information of cardiovascular disease, and we can triangulate that evidence. So we can also look at the genetically predicted CRP levels towards cardiovascular disease. Why is that important? Well, what this does is because 
there is a random segregation of allele during meiosis. Whether you have a genetic variance of low or high CRP is random. And because it's random, there is no confounding. It's like a randomized control trial. So by having the genetic variance instead of the CRP levels, in effect, uh, you approximate a randomized control trial and you can come closer to suggesting causality. Now, Medellin randomization has become the uh, last years a very popular methodology in epidemiology because we can suggest and go closer to causality. We have used this approach, for example, for C-reactive protein, where we have looked at a wide spread of outcomes, and we can see, for example, that C-reactive protein is associated with uh, schizophrenia. Um, you see multiple bars here because we are doing a lot of sensitivity analysis to address um, the, um, the Mendelian randomization assumptions. Uh, but we see, for example, here that the results are uh, consistent in all sensitivity analysis, uh, which is not the case for coronary artery disease, um, where despite the fact that C-reactive protein has been associated many times in observational epidemiology with uh, coronary heart disease, Mendelian randomization that does not support causation. What this um, shows us is that probably there are genetic variants that are pleiotropic, um, and the effect C-reactive proteins and the effect also coronary artery disease risk through independent pathways. Um, and Mendelian randomization, as I said, has become very popular. Here is a systematic review we have done to sort of collect the evidence of uh, Mendelian randomization studies. We had um, thousands of analyses that we extracted from the literature and a vast um, range of uh, categories uh, of uh, risk factors that have been examined. However, if you looked at which of those had robust evidence for um, causal associations with cardiovascular disease, you would see that th those were just a small minority. And, um, also, those were the risk factors we already know about. So despite the fact that you know, there is a, a huge range of risk factors that have been um, associated with Mendelian randomization, and there is, for, for the vast majority of those, there is not clear evidence that their association is likely to be causal. And we can go a step further and um, use the same approach to study the effect of uh, drugs. So instead of CRP, if we have here a target of therapeutic intervention with its downstream phenotype, again, we have the genetic variants that affect uh, this intervention. So for example, if we think at statins, we know the target gene and the target protein of statins. And by chance, some people will have genetic variants that um, give them higher and lower level of this protein, which is the target of the drug. So it, will be, it is a little bit like a randomized control trial, whereas some people, by chance, are getting a drug or are getting a placebo, for example. And we can use the same methodology here to to give the, uh, the paradigm of the um, randomized control trial uh, and um, try to predict the effects of drug on different phenotypes. So we, an example here um, we did with uh, Depender Jill. Uh, we were fortunate to have uh, Depender as our PhD student and we looked at predicting with this approach uh, the effect of uh, blood pressure drug, so having genetically predicted uh, blood pressure drug, and the effect of, uh, on different phenotypes. The first thing we did is that we sort of looked at the association of those uh, drugs with um, coronary heart disease and stroke with Mendelian randomization and also looked at the literature, the effect uh, estimate from the randomized control trials, and we compared those two. We found that those matched very well, and that gave us, um, um, uh, that shows us that the approach is probably working well. So having had that evidence, we 
further looked at the range of phenotypes. So that's a phenome-wide association study on uh, one of those drugs uh, that across the phenome studies the effect of this drug with multiple phenotypes. And of course, we find cardiovascular phenotypes that we expected, but we also found an association, an inverse association with uh, diverticulosis. Um, which shows us a potential side effect of uh, that drug that we weren't aware of. And um, with this approach, we can sort of tar study off-target effects, for example, or drug repurposing opportunities, uh, associating um, uh, drugs with um, diseases and outcomes that are not uh, used uh, at the moment to treat. Now, I promised to open the, the black box of epidemiology, and really um, there is a black box linking sometimes the genome to the phenome. So we find these associations between the genetic variants and the phenotypes, but we really don't know many times what's the pathway, what links them in between. And nowadays with molecular epidemiology, we have the technologies to measure thousands of those um, intermediate pathways and molecules. Well, we can measure the, the transcriptome, so how the DNA is transcribed to RNA. We can measure the proteins, and we can measure the metabolites that take part in um, uh, how proteins interact. And we have done a lot on metabolomics in particular. These are you know, low molecular weight metabolites uh, that can show us the metabolic pathways that link the genome to the phenome. Um, this is one of the first studies we did on uh, metabolomics. It was the first time um, different cohorts with metabolomic studies came together. We had three cohorts, the MESA study in the States, the Rotterdam study um, in Rotterdam, and the Lollipop study in the UK. And it took us seven years to do this paper because the, in order to harmonize the metabolomics data across different cohorts um, was a hard thing to do. It's much easier now uh, that we know better the technologies, uh, but at that time, uh, it took us time to understand how to bring together those data. But um, we managed to show, so we, we investigated the associations between metabolomics data, metabolites, and atherosclerosis. We had two measures of atherosclerosis in the carotid arteries uh, and in uh, coronary artery calcium, uh, in the artery that supply um, blood to the heart. And those were the metabolites that were associated with both phenotypes. It was interesting that those were consistent between the two phenotypes. And then we plugged those metabolites into a network, a metabolic network, which was able to highlight which um, um, metabolic pathways are perturbated during um, atherosclerosis. And it really shows you know, the systemic nature of the disease, that a lot of those pathways uh, are affected and may be perturbated. Now we can go a step further. This is a work in progress. We can go a step further to show associations between the genetic variants, the endpoints, the phenotypes, and the metabolites. Here we have a well-known uh, genetic locus, APOE, which we know it is um, a gene that is associated with Alzheimer's disease. It's a gene that is associated with coronary artery disease, a gene that is associated with carotid atherosclerosis. However, is it associated through the same pathway? Here we associate the uh, genetic loci with metabolites and with the endpoints. And what we saw is that there are distinct metabolic pathways linking this gene to the phenotype each time. Here is a study just published by Abbas Tenhan, um, again uh, showing the associations between Alzheimer's disease genes with metabolomics data 
And we found here a very interesting association between APCA7. It, it is a gene that we know it increases your risk of Alzheimer's disease. However, we don't know why. And that gene seems to be associated with um, a range of metabolites uh, that uh, take part in the metabolism of lactoceramide and highlighted a very important pathway that could play a role in Alzheimer's disease uh, and Alzheimer's disease treatment. Now, I'm doing other work which um, I didn't have time to um, discuss and um, future work. So, uh, a lot of our interest now focus around cardiovascular risk and neurodegenerative diseases and dementia and how this uh, is shared between the two. And um, um, we are working with US colleagues in Harvard and MIT to look for drug repurposing opportunities for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. This is uh, NIH funded research uh, and with the UK Dementia Research Institute to study etiological risk factors for dementia that are shared with uh, cardiovascular traits. Um, we have an interest in multimorbidity or multiple uh, conditions that coexist in individuals and here we have the co-leading the BRC uh, theme the, on uh, multimorbidity uh, and also with a focus on studying sex differences. A lot of the GWA studies have been done uh, on uh, both sexes but now we have the data uh, and the numbers to look specifically uh, whether there are genetic variants for example that are specific uh, to one uh, sex and on electronic health record data. Now, finishing off, I think I had uh, many opportunities in uh, my career. Um, I had a very supportive parents that helped me a lot. I had very good education. Uh, my father told me that I can do anything. <laughs> and uh, I had very good mentors, which really helped me. And I'm really thankful to them for being uh, here today and being supportive all the way. And I had a very supportive family. Um, again, uh, giving me uh, the opportunity of thinking that I can do anything and, you know, uh, I can raise the family uh, but uh, be a professor at the same time. But I want other people to have opportunities as well. And that's how I was uh, involved in the Opportunities Committee, which was also a very rewarding experience for me and it taught me a lot. And uh, I think a lot of things have uh, happened uh, since then and they are continuing uh, to make this a better place for everyone to work with, not just for uh, gender differences, but for all inequalities. Um, there is some way to go. I have to tell you that um, a photographer was waiting for me for the picture that you saw in the initial slide a few months ago at Imperial. I went to greet them at the entrance. Um, and they asked me whether I can show them the office and the common area to find the place for the photo. I showed them both and he told me, that's great, I'll set up the equipment, please ask the professor to come. <laughs> <laughs> so I know I, I don't look like a professor, but we need to you know, move away from that uh, idea that the professors look somehow. Um, and um, make further improvements. Uh, finally, um, I try to give the same opportunities to my students and I'm grateful that I had a few of those mugs of the academic uh, choice uh, and uh, I'm grateful that, you know, I, that they have also um, found the same support that I found uh, during um, this, my career path. So, <laughs> academia can be really hard sometimes and, you know, maybe some of the, what the, the picture said is true, but I'm, I'm very uh, lucky that I found people to work with that I'm proud for 
uh, and you know colleagues uh, and uh, students that you know uh, we had a good re working relationship uh, we had good respect for each other uh, and I really enjoy every day working with it I would like to thank a lot my mentors, I would like to thank Paul a lot for all this year of uh, collaboration and Deborah and many other of my colleagues, our management and admin support all those years um, and all our trainees uh, and my parents and family and all of you for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. So, if you weren't sure before what it takes to be a professor at Imperial, I think that was a beautiful illustration. Now, as I said, Joanne's agreed to take a few questions, and there will then be time afterwards, particularly for people who are here, to, to ask them over drinks. But anybody want to kick us off? Look at the audience here, and Dev, have you got any questions online yet? Okay, well, the I was going to say the lot in the audience are being slow, but actually we have one right at the back. And can I ask the people here physically, yes, to, to speak into the mic so that others can, can hear them? Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. But I'm a bit concerned that you are focusing on the details of, say, the heart, and that is not really where... Um, the the uh, the problem is, what is the cause of these problems? I've had heart disease and um, pre-diabetic. I'm not obese, and nor was uh, most of the people I've seen. And that always seems to be part of the uh, list of causes. Um, and maybe obese people do have it, but it's not the general picture. And I'm just wondering, uh, have you done much research in uh, seeking uh, whether the brain is the cause of these problems? Like uh, on the autoimmune system, for instance, with cancer, it's the brain which is causing this, I feel, but also the the hypothalamus gives instructions to the pituitary gland and the hormones are what really maintain our bodies. And there's a, if there's a fault there, then all those problems are caused by the brain. Now, has anyone uh, uh, researched into how it's possible to correct these faults in the brain? Might be a debate over drinks, but um, have you got a brief? Thank you for that. It is true, as you said, that those diseases are multifactorial. They have a lot of causes, both genetic, environmental, lifestyle, that each one of those causes has a, a small contribution towards to whether the disease will uh, progress or not. And the, how much and you know, what other risk factors are there, we are still um, looking for it. There is definitely a heart-brain axis that communicates between the two organs, uh, and that's why those two diseases are uh, interrelated. But we can discuss more about that afterwards. Thank you. So is minding all the people online, so we'll take a question there, and then we'll come back to the live audience. Well, the people online are live as well, but you know what I mean. <laughs> well, um, thanks, Joanna, for the wonderful talk. I think there's a, a question from the online audience. Um, it's about the prevalence of schizophrenia in ethnic groups. So what we have seen so far is that cardiovascular diseases are quite common in South Asians compared to other populations. Is that also true for, for uh, schizophrenia in, in uh, different ancestries? Uh, definitely variation between uh, the ancestries uh, in terms for uh, mental health and neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, 
Um, and it's true that you know, in our uh, genetic analysis, a lot of different ancestries are underrepresented. And we still don't understand well um, the, how much difference there is between the different uh, ancestries. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Oh, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned about the role of um, healthy diet and lifestyle um, earlier on. Um, are there any indications that um, adopting such um, lifestyle and, and food could nudge uh, metabolic pathways for individuals away from certain disease phenotypes, uh, whether CVD or uh, others? Yes, we, we know well that those um, lifestyle factors associate with cardiovascular risk, but also many other diseases sort of new generative diseases, metabolic diseases, uh, and uh, several cancers, um, you can decrease the risk of uh, disease by adopting a healthy lifestyle. Okay. Well, I think in the interest of time, probably take one last question. Um, Raj. Hi, uh, my name is Raj Bansali. I'm in the uh, statistics section of mathematics department. Now, first of all, let me say congratulations. The uh, point that struck me was how epidemiological studies have moved from lifestyle factors to analysis of DNA. But the term that I had not come across until today, or until your lecture, is Mendelian randomization. Could you elaborate on what it is? What is the origin of the not, not a long lecture, but uh, in what way it differs from standard statistical randomization? Yes, yeah, so the idea of Mendelian randomization has been there for a while. There is a paper from the 80s, if I am not mistaken, that launched the idea, but it hasn't actually been used to study causal associations uh, until uh, some decades ago. So I would say around 2009 uh, were the first studies that instead of trying to show an association between a risk factor and a disease, trying to find an association of the genes that affect those risk factors with the disease, uh, in terms, the reason why we are doing this is to avoid confounding and to avoid reverse causation because the genes, we have them from birth. Uh, so when we show an association between the genes and the disease, we don't have to worry about reverse causation. And it proved very popular due to also the, that it's a neat idea and you can, no, you can support causality, you cannot prove it but also because due to the availability of the genome-wide association study and the data uh, that was available from those published studies, uh, a lot of researchers can actually download the summary data from the genome-wide association study and do a number of Mendelian randomization analysis. Thank you. So what I'm going to do now is to call upon our colleague, and you've heard him, talked about Professor Paul Elliott to propose a vote of thanks. So, Paul, over to you. Yes, thanks very much, Deborah. So, um, I'd just like to start, uh, Joanna, saying I thought that was a really terrific lecture. And uh, for the younger members of the audience, uh, showing, you know, as a role model, what can be achieved. And also, I didn't know, maybe if I'd known at the interview, uh, <laughs> that you'd failed medical stu studies twice and then was rejected twice by Imperial College. <laughs> so, um, you know, it just shows that, you know, determination and motivation and knowing and having such a supportive bunch of people around you and your family and saying, you know, I can do this and I want to do this. It's, I think it's a fantastic, um, uh, <clears throat> as I say, role model. And also the role that you took in the Athena Swan and promoting, as you say, not just women, but uh, opportunities generally. I think that's really important. And I'd also, uh, Jerry Folk, folks is in the audience. And Jerry, <laughs> I did speak to you <laughs> at the time of the interview. And uh, you gave such a glowing uh, account of Joanna and her skills and talents that we were able to defeat all sort of rules of Imperial College and appoint Joanna to a, a junior lectureship without actually having done a postdoc. And Joanna just reminded us of that. And I don't think I could do that again. <laughs> but it was obviously a very inspired choice. And also, you showed us at the end there um, all those cups that you got for uh, your own giving back 
as a as a supervisor and the appreciation of your students, and I think that's that's fantastic as well. So I'd like uh, you all to join me in thanking Joanna for a really fantastic, all-encompassing uh, talk and for being an inspiration uh, to us all, actually, about how to proceed in academic life. And some of it is a bit like that. But <laughs> fortunately uh, for Joanna, that wasn't the case. So thanks very much, Joanna. It was really Thank you, Paul. So that discussion could have gone a lot longer. Fortunately, at least for those of us who are here at Imperial today, we can carry on the discussion over wine or non-alcoholic alternatives, I hope are available. This is the School of Public Health after all. So please do come and join us. Talk to Joanna, talk to each other. There's all sorts of colleagues here who may not have seen. And for those online, thank you so much for attending. And sorry you can't join this discussion, but please do have either a glass of wine or a cup of tea or whatever's appropriate at your time zone, because it's not necessarily cocktail hour for all of you. But, so I'd invite you, I don't know whether we, whether we need to go, you want me to go back up and then round unless you, unless you need to come out this way, and then we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you very much indeed.